PWC out this week. I'm back to the Crime Fighter. Another week has passed and I'm still not in the intensive care unit on an oxygen tank face down in critical condition. They insisted I was doomed and suicidal for doing these bad behaviors the past several weeks. But I'm here again, quite healthy, to present this episode we'll call After Hours with Crimey. So Missouri is no longer under any COVID-19 restrictions. A few weeks after every Karen and Daryl went into orbit in a massive freakout where hundreds and hundreds of people were at pool parties in the Ozarks, that hospitals everywhere were going to be flooded with sick patients and hundreds more were going to die horrific deaths because they were selfish and too stupid to know what was good for them by staying home by themselves. The news media was all giddy doing their mask shaming even though several of them were called out with masks off live on air at times. Of course that freak out ended when protesting racism began. It took two weeks after the fact before a second person was reported to have contracted it. But there's still been no mass outbreak as feared. Wrestling events are happening again in Missouri with fans. This Saturday in fact. Cape Championship Wrestling returns to Cape Girardeau, Missouri on June 27th at the AC Brace Arena. Tickets available at capewrestling.com. Missouri is also going to still hold its state fair in Sedalia, Missouri as possibly the only state fair in the Midwest to go on. We salute Governor Mike Parson for having the courage to go against the paranoid Karens and Darrells who continue to insist everything should stay locked down indefinitely. Illinois, however, has canceled its state fair by another one of Governor Pritzker's executive orders. However, it appears to be illegal as the State Fair Act says the state is required to hold its fair into Springfield and to coin. The Act does not specify rules or circumstances in canceling the fair, nor does it specify penalties for doing so. The state legislature, of course, was not consulted. The governor just unilaterally did it like all his other EOs, claiming an unspecified statute gives him the ability to suspend laws. I predict yet another lawsuit will be filed challenging this action. As to whom will take up the torch, we don't know. It will cost the Springfield region upwards of $86 million in lost revenue. Speaking of cancellations, the governor is still strong, arming cities and counties to cancel events, threatening to cut off all state funds. A colleague is angry because he was set to perform in a band in one of those communities holding July 4th festivities that came to the pressure. So when the protests against racism and police brutality began and raged for weeks, many advocates for reopening Illinois took note of the toll about face elected leaders and media types made in regards to large gatherings demanding to know why protesting reopening spread COVID-19, but suddenly protesting racism did not. Some of these pro-lockdown leaders and medical professionals went against their own rules and participated, demonstrating a high level of hypocrisy. While well, an admission was made where one of the individuals involved in the protest stated they were so tired of the police brutality and racism that they were willing to risk their lives to protest it. Incidentally, the percentage of American COVID-19 cases, 64%, are of minorities according to a CDC study. African Americans and Latinos. So the virus does have a racial bias, it seems. Politicians did nothing to discourage protesting giving, given the higher risk of infection. They are probably breathing a sigh of relief. There hasn't been a spike among demonstrators though, so far. However, judges on the 7th Circuit Court of Appeals did take notice of that sudden about face. While Supreme Court Justice Brett Kavanaugh declined to rule on whether Pritzker's EO restricting churches from holding religious services when the governor capitulated just hours before the case was heard, fearing he was going to lose, the case was not over as the plaintiffs continued to seek a ruling barring the governor from reimposing the restrictions ever again. And to no one's surprise, who took the brunt of the questioning was the state attorney general asked to compare and explain the restrictions on worship services versus the governor's allowance for social services, such as food distribution, to continue at churches without restriction, as well as the governor's seemingly hearty endorsement of mass gatherings and demonstrations in the name of civil rights. 
Even with that line of questioning, sadly, they ruled in the governor's favor. I mentioned two weeks ago that Judge Brett Kavanaugh should have weighed in on Elim Romanian versus Pritzker instead of dismiss without prejudice. At the time, the Thomas More Society, which had filed several lawsuits on behalf of several Illinois churches against the state's public health restrictions, said after Pritzker dropped them, it was a victory for religious freedom. Well, you only won a battle, but not the actual war. Over in California, a church suing the state over its restrictions was heard by the full U.S. Supreme Court, and they lost in a 5-4 decision. That ruling influenced the Seventh Circuit, citing comments made by Chief Justice John Roberts, where he claimed large church gatherings aren't the same as large gatherings at the grocery store, warehouses, meatpacking plants, etc. Kavanaugh, in his dissent, stated, in his view, the businesses are not subject to the restrictions, which he noted include malls, pet groomers, hair salons, and marijuana dispensaries are comparable to gatherings at houses of worship, and California did not show a good reason for treating houses of worship differently. Make no mistake, Pritzker most definitely has been judge shopping throughout. When he knows he will lose a case, he will try to get the case transferred to another court that will more likely rule in his favor. If he cannot, he wusses out and capitulates before a ruling is made. This is why Pritzker wants the Bailey lawsuit in federal court and out of Judge Michael McHaney's courtroom because he knows he'll lose. It's also why he caved to Chicago reporter Amy Jacobson's federal lawsuit after he banned her from press briefings for speaking at a reopen Illinois protest. Kavanaugh would have shot down the Illinois restrictions, so he took his chances with the Seventh Circuit Court of Appeals and came out with a victory. A pull quote from the ruling, feeding the body requires teams of people to work together in physical spaces, but churches can feed the spirit in other ways. Sorry, that's not acceptable! The First Amendment states, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. That means the government has absolutely no right to restrict worship services even in a pandemic. The Supreme Court essentially has ruled the Constitution and your civil rights can be suspended in a pandemic. This was a dead wrong ruling. I should state the Supreme Court has been referred to as the most conservative court in decades. Considering the rulings that have come out, come out of there on multiple cases the last few weeks, sure hasn't turned out that way. Roberts decided to become the new Anthony Kennedy. Some have even called him the new David Souter and tailor his rulings on which way the wind blows, which is how Obamacare survived on a 5-4 decision by rewriting the law from the bench himself. For the Karens and the Darrells insisting on keeping the lockdowns in place for fear the hospitals are going to be overrun, Memorial Medical System, which includes Memorial Hospital in Springfield, have laid off hundreds of healthcare workers or furloughed for several months. The key selling point of the lockdowns was to prevent hospitals from having far more patients than they can handle. Temporary medical facilities were set up in McCormick Place, but that ended up going almost entirely unused. But what is actually happening is healthcare is losing millions of dollars due to lack of patients, and healthcare workers are losing their jobs. I wonder if some of the laid off healthcare workers were those harassing anti lockdown activists. I wonder if they're happy to finally shelter in the basements now for the next several months on unemployment benefits. How's that karma feel? One and a half million healthcare workers were laid off in April. Not many of those have been rehired thus far. Because of the blatant double standard fully displayed by politicians and medical professionals, the public at large is not listening to them anymore, and they shouldn't. Dr. Anthony Fauci made an admission recently contradicting statements he made in the early days of the pandemic. He discouraged the use of masks, saying they didn't work back in February. 
He admitted that was a lie and lied repeatedly for weeks in interviews here and abroad. He and his colleagues mocked people who bought and wore masks anyway. He lied to you because PPE and N95 masks were in short supply and he wanted healthcare workers to have masks in treating the ill. The CDC admitted such. Fauci should be fired. The guy was never elected to anything, yet operates as the leader of the unelected fourth branch of government. He cannot be trusted. His credibility is gone. The end result is a mass partisan divide where a majority of the Democrats wear masks every time they leave the House, but far less Republicans do. Fauci made a bad situation worse with his dishonesty, and this quack should be shown the door. There will remain people who will need years of major psychological therapy to get over their personal terror of contradict, contracting the virus, who still want to play social distance warrior, but they don't wield power like they used to. It's shifted to far more radical and dangerous organizations. Well, it's a good time to take a time out because I have some completely different subjects to talk about that aren't COVID-19 related. But they are still dicey subjects and that cause massive butthurt if anyone dares say something challenging the mainstream narratives. We shall continue with After Hours with Crimey after the break. As drivers, we make a million little choices each and every time we get behind the wheel. Choices like distracted driving, DUI, speeding, and no seatbelt are proven killers. But there's another threat lurking on your roadways that you need to consider. It's the choice by drivers to ignore the move over law. This lethal choice has led to the death of first responders from all over the state. Men and women sworn to serve and protect you, the people of Illinois. Slow down, move over, it's the law. A little bit of additional information on COVID. Illinois is supposed to start phase four on Friday, limiting indoor gatherings at 50, and Pritzker is offering $900 million in funding for rent and mortgage assistance and business grants through the federal COVID-19 relief package. The bulk of the money will be doled out as grants to businesses that were forced to shut down or restrict operations due to the Wuhan virus pandemic. Sorry, too little, too late. The companies that went out of business are coming back. And that money absolutely should not be coming from the taxpayers. Pritzker should be pulling out a billion dollars out of his own personal bank account instead. He can afford it. He's worth $33 billion. And really, he's the only one who should be held responsible for screwing the state over. By the way, he spent last weekend in Michigan at the Lighthouse Equestrian Center among large crowds. Meanwhile, IWA Mid-South returned to action in Indiana last Friday and the Karens and Daryls went on another major meltdown. Oh, a bunch of people without masks were crowded indoors watching wrestling show. Couple hundred new instant COVID infections. Number of pro wrestlers complained, no masks, we're social distancing. One particular social distance clown called Indiana backward for easing lockdown restrictions at all. Seriously, guys? Wisconsin is holding indoor shows with fans the last few weeks. Where is the freak out then? Heck, I interviewed one of the promoters on this very show a couple weeks ago. Kate Gerardo is hosting CCW indoors this Saturday at the AC Brace Arena. 
Indiana just entered phase four of reopening. Masks are simply recommended. They are not required. Indoor gatherings are capped at 250 people. In phase five, which begins July the 4th, most rates will be done with, but the 250 cap will remain. So your beef here is with Governor Eric Holcomb, not IWA Mid-South, because the state reopening plan allowed this show to happen. To the wrestling news media, should have done your homework. This was lazy reporting. Truth be told, if it was any other promotion, you wouldn't have heard a peep about it, and it's bloody obvious here why this promotion was singled out. Some of this may be for another reason, which I'll get to a little later. During pro wrestling, uh, Kansas City made it a point to announce they were changing the name of a show that's already happened, maybe for DVD video release. Jury Pro called their February event Space Age Love Song Electric Boogaloo, but after hearing some right authoritarian movement was co-opting the word, they changed it to a phrase that is not at all family friendly, but it's a vulgar shot at the axis. The term Boogaloo actually refers to a social funk dance originating in Chicago within the African American community that has crossover appeal to white teenagers. The legendary singer, James Brown, released a track based on it. The style was picked up in California where it was developed further and actually was a cultural component of the black power movement in Oakland during the 1960s. Electric Boogaloo refers to a dance group in a 1984 movie called Breakin' Two, which was all about break dancing. Militia groups late last year started using the term to define the sequel to the Civil War. The so-called Boogaloo movement is not even a year old and still quite obscure, yet the mainstream media wants you to believe it is a very well-organized, funded group with chapters all over the country. But the radically left-wing and recently declared terrorist organization Antifada that's been around for five years, has their own national flag, recognized by the United Nations, who have attacked and injured numerous people, actually doesn't exist. Sorry, not buying the hype. There's a sure push for civil war going on, but it's most definitely coming from the left-wing, woke Taliban mob. So was jury pearls virtue signaling necessary in this case? No, not really. But the bane of their existence is to cater heavily to the political correctness crowd. Central Illinois Pro Wrestling Hall of Famer Mustafa Ali spoke out about the problems with law enforcement and his support for BLM to Sports Illustrated. He served as a Chicago policeman for four years, taking a sabbatical from the ring before making a comeback and going to WWE. Quote, so when you have a criminal justice system that is designed to profit off people getting arrested, when you have a prison industry that is designed to profit off people getting arrested and incarcerated, what are the police going to do? They're going to arrest people because it's profitable. So it's not police reform, it's not just the criminal justice system, it's the entire economic structure behind it. The system is not designed to help people, it's designed to hunt people. Until we reform the entire system and we get away from any kind of profit motives, then there will be no reform. There will be no change. You take the money and the profit out of it, that's when you will reform. That's when you'll see change. The Black Lives Matter movement isn't something that happened overnight. It's not something that one black man being murdered. This is 400 years of getting shoved and hit and kicked and spit on and murdered and raped, insulted and degraded and killed. This is 400 years of that. The Black Lives Matter movement is essential to the survival of every black man and woman in this country. Yeah, there's going to be that permanent scar there, and the only way to repair that relationship is massive change, and yes, it starts with the police. Well, not all African Americans support the Black Lives Matter political platform. It has a very heavy pro-Marxist ideology to which one of its leaders admitted as such. Muhammad Ali Jr., the son of the legendary boxer, said his dad would have hated BLM and called it racist. It's not just Black Lives Matter, White Lives Matter, Chinese Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, Everybody's Lives Matter. God loves everyone. He's never singled anyone out. Killing is wrong no matter who it is. It's a racial statement. It's pitting black people against everyone else. It starts racial things to happen. I hate that. He also trashed Hillary Clinton and voiced his support for Donald Trump. 
So my thoughts on profit motive. Politicians want that money to pay for their spending. They make the laws with the fines baked in, and they keep voting to increase them. The police are there to enforce what lawmakers pass and governors sign into law. It really should start with them. Speaking of money grabs, Mayor Lori Beelgeuse Lightfoot made her city a boatload of money having every car in a one square mile area towed because she wanted to stop a church service from being held in a blatant abuse of power. Also, people are breaking traffic laws left and right up there where it's very difficult to drive. While I love Prince Ali, I would have liked to have heard what he had in mind to stop the violence and killings in the city. Because after cutting down citations for moving violations, that doesn't address the bigger ongoing problem for the last decade or so. The soda tax queen, Tony Prick Finkel, the pathological liar who claimed she was jacking up beverage taxes to fund law enforcement, but gave the money out to her political cronies almost immediately and lost to Lightfoot in a landslide, announced they are defunding the Chicago PD. This in light of gun violence spiking where multiple people are dead and dozens wounded. The gun violence in Chicago has been pointed out over and over and over again for a decade. Obama only talked about it one time in his eight years as president, did nothing. The leadership of Chicago, Richard Daley, Rahm Emanuel, the previous mayors, and the current mayor have been totally ineffective. Lightfoot cares more about stopping house parties at this point. And what exactly has BLM done to stop or reduce gun violence? I'd really like to know. When law enforcement goes away, conditions on the ground are not going to get better. It will disintegrate, and many places in the world it became third world. It's already happening. Either militias will rise up and declare themselves the law, unaccountable to no one, or organized crime and street games will take over. MS-13, for example, is one of the most violent street games in the country. You want to live under their rule? I think not. You want to live under anarchist incursions like the one in Seattle where the mayor and the governor surrendered the city to those thugs and they let a guy die who was shot? I mean, I can't believe this incursion act hasn't been invoked and the military sent in by now. Our neighbor to the south, Mexico. Who's the law there? The drug cartels run the country, even if El Chapo is in U.S. custody. Andreas Manuel Lopez Obrador may think he's the president and chief commander of the armed forces there, but he has struggled to bring them under control just like all the previous presidents there. No one is safe, and early this year, a Lucha Libre promoter was murdered in a restaurant execution style that got very little coverage in wrestling media in fear of reprisals. Gun sales in the United States are skyrocketing. If the police aren't going to be around, people will have to take the law into their own hands. The Chicago Teachers Union wants the police out of their schools, yet there's big opposition to arming the teachers instead. What if there's another Columbine? Who's going to come save you? Prickfinkel? Lightfoot? No! You're on your own as you're dodging bullets. Gun control won't stop it either. Majority of American people oppose defunding the police, but a majority of Democrats do. If they think this will win them power, make it the centerpiece of their re-election campaigns. They will be crushed like cockroaches. Joe Biden, Roy Wisely, is not going along with this foolish idea. The girl is this Well, in the midst of COVID and protesting racism, the Me Too movement is now firing back up and combining with anti-bullying advocates to form this speaking out movement. Late last week, a Twitter group calling itself the PW Truth Project put out a list of several dozen names that were accused of some sort of abuse, either bullying or sexual misconduct. Descriptions of what everyone was accused of, when or who, didn't accompany the names. You had to find that information yourself. They also branded a few feds, one of them, All American Wrestling Out of Chicago, as an unsafe promotion. While some of the names have statements from the accused, some are out there for no explanation. A few of those folks challenged their inclusion directly, such as Ryan Satin. 
Some of the entries appeared to be recycled from years past in which the matter had been resolved, such as Sean Orleans and Rich Swan, and should not have been included. Sue Young, who has demanded repeatedly people leave her and her husband alone, has to be pissed. Someone else is butting into their affairs again. Ironically, Molly Chapman, who accused Orleans and Michael Elgin, was herself on the list of the accused abusers. Orleans has since been removed from it. Elgin, though, has been called out by a Canadian wrestler for sending unsolicited pictures of his private parts in 2016. When the Mo Elgin situation was raging, she attempted to get her story out to the wrestling media, but the ugly ignored her. For others on the list, they misspelled several names, most laughably McMahon instead of McMahon. Vinnie Mac was charged with crimes against humanity. Also laughably, Botchamania was listed as well, I guess for making fun of all the wrestlers committing bloopers every month. There are so many names on the list, I cannot go through them all tonight. I will likely post comments on the St. Louis wrestling community. The desired effect has already been achieved. Several wrestlers have been suspended or fired. Dave Lagana was forced to resign from the National Wrestling Alliance. Jack Gallagher of WWE was fired. David Starr states he was a terrible partner but not a sexual predator, and if this means the end of his career, so be it. Remains to be seen if anyone presses charges against anyone. If crimes were committed, they absolutely should face justice in a courtroom. But if the goal is permanent blacklisting from the sport, they are still free to walk the streets to do it again. On the local scene, a number of heated accusations have been flying back and forth between a number of individuals so fast, I cannot process it all. Now here's the issues I have with the PW Truth Project list. You put this out and expect the kangaroo court of public opinion and online lynch mobs to do the dirty work without any due process. This is a perversion of justice. It's very dicey trying to figure out what's legit and what is bogus. And guess what? If your information is dead wrong, they can haul you into court for slander and defamation. Twitter is not a substitute for a courtroom. They've learned absolutely nothing from the Mo Elgin saga. And don't get me wrong. There are credible allegations. There are guilty people. There are also innocent people that get falsely accused. I speak from what I've seen play out last year with the previous allegations not holding up under scrutiny. This is branding people guilty until proven innocent. And even if proven innocent, we're going to violate the double jeopardy clause in the Fifth Amendment repeatedly until you're banished to a remote island in the Pacific in lifetime exile. Now the victims are calling out the individuals that abused them. In every case, it should be looked upon as a trust but verified basis instead of merely face value. I put more trust in the individual speaking out than a blind list. Amazingly, Molly has kept quiet and hasn't tweeted since March. Dre McBean, if you remember her, calling Molly out, has been working to provide some context to what the charges are beside each name. It is a work in progress. This will be a story we'll follow for weeks and it will be a complicated one to untangle, but we'll do our best. May do a deep dive into the individual stories next week. But until then, we have once again come to a close on another episode of PWCI After Hours with Crimey. Until next time, the spin is making me dizzy.